getting into some dependent origination. This is the Maha Tanha Sankhya Sutta, the greater discourse on the destruction of craving. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Vanath and Pendika's Park. Now on that occasion a pernicious view had arisen in a monk named Sati, son of a fisherman. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. That is a Brahman view. That is the idea of reincarnation, which I know some Buddhists really like. But the Buddha didn't teach reincarnation. He taught rebirth. So. Several monks, having heard about this, went to the monk Sati and asked him, Friend Sati, is it true that such a pernicious view had arisen in you? That's such a dumb question. Are you so stupid as to believe this? Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> exactly so, friends. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. Then those monks, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus. Friend Sati, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many ways, the Blessed One has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen. Since without a condition, there's no origination of consciousness. You'll get to understand that more in, in a little bit. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned, those monks and by those monks in this way, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Since those monks were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him all that had occurred. Adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, from this pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come, monk, tell the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and he went to the monk Sati and told him, The teacher calls you, friend Sati. Yes, friend, and he went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Sati, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? 
as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. Exactly so, Venerable Sir, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. What is that consciousness, Sati? Venerable Sir, it is that which speaks and feels and experiences here and there the re results of good and bad actions. So this view is a very strong belief in a soul that keeps going up and down depending on the actions of the person. Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness? But you, misguided men, have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp. <coughs> Excuse me. And injured yourself and stored up much demerit. For this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. Monks, what do you think? Has this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma and discipline? How could he, venerable sir? No, venerable sir. When this was said, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and without response. Then knowing this, the Blessed One told him, Misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. I shall question the monks on this matter. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me as this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, does when he misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit? And he still remembered 2,600 years later. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, he was the son of a fisherman, but he hated the smell of fish. That's why he became a monk, so he didn't have to be around that. No, venerable sir, for in many discourses, the Blessed One has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen. <laughs> Since without a condition, there's no origination of consciousness. Good monks, it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus. For in many ways I have stated consciousness to be dependently arisen. Since without a condition, there is no origination of consciousness. But this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit. For this will lead to the harm and suffering of this misguided man for a long time. Right after this discourse was given, Sati disrobed 
and he became a layman and he was going around talking to other people and saying that the Buddha was wrong and he didn't understand the Dhamma and all of these sorts of things. So he really dug himself into a deep hole. Okay, now we're going to go to the conditionality of consciousness. Monk's consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on the I and forms, it is reckoned as I consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the tongue and flavors, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. Just as a fire is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it burns, when fire burns dependent on logs, it is reckoned as a log fire. When fire burns dependent on branches, it is reckoned as a branch fire. When fire burns dependent on grass, it is reckoned as a grass fire. When fire burns dependent on cow dung, it is reckoned as a cow dung fire. In case you didn't know, uh, in India they use cow dung for their fires, but they use cow dung. Um, a lot of their cabins are made out of uh, mud. And they take the, the cow dung and they mix it in water and then they paint it on the inside, on the floors, the ceiling, the walls, everything. And that stops a lot of the bugs from coming in. Um, so does this mean that consciousness, our consciousness, arises afresh? That's right. Did, did, did you hear me talk the other night about... Ooh, it snapped. <laughs> That was roughly a hundred thousand arising and passing away of ear consciousness. And consciousness is also an element, like the fire you're describing, or am I thinking of something else? One of the elements. Yes, it is one of the elements. So like the fire he's describing. Well, he's, he's describing the difference between one kind of fire and another, just like consciousness is different from one sense door to the other. When fire burns dependent on chafe, it is reckoned as a chafe fire. <coughs> When fire burns dependent on rubbish, it is reckoned as a rubbish fire. So too, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. <coughs> when consciousness arises dependent on the eye and forms, it is reckoned as eye consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the nose and odors, 
it is reckoned as knows consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the tongue and flavors, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. Now we're going to go to a general questionnaire on being. Monks, do you see this has come to be? This is the first noble truth. Okay? You'll see more in just a minute. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, do you see its origination occurs with that as nutriment? This is the second noble truth. Nutriment means what your, your attention, uh, your attention uh, focuses on. I'll explain that later. Monks, do you see with the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation? That's the third noble truth. What's the fourth noble truth? The six R's. When you practice the six R's, you're practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. So you start to get more and more a feel of how important it is to use the six R's because that purifies your mind. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Has this come to be? If you're uncertain, that means you don't know. You don't see it. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Does its origination occur with that as nutriment? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? With the cessation? Excuse me. With the cessation of nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees it as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? This has come to be. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? This has come to be. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. 
Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? This has come to be. Yes, venerable sir. So he's asking about their direct experience. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, as purified and bright as this view is, if you adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it, and treat it as a possession, would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a, a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of craving and clinging? No, Venerable Sir. Monks, purified and bright as this view is, if you do not adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it, and treat it as a possession, would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of craving and clinging? Yes, Venerable Sir. Now we're going to talk about nutriment and dependent origination. Monks, there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the support of those about to be about to come to be what for they are physical food as nutriment gross or subtle contact as the second formations as the third and consciousness as the fourth now these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced. These four kinds of nutriment have craving as their source, craving as their origin. They are born and produced from craving. And this craving has what as its source, what as its origin, from what is it born and produced. Craving has feeling as its source, feeling as its origin. It is born and produced from feeling. And this feeling has what as its source, what is its origin from what is it born and produced? Feeling has contact as its source. Contact as its origin. It is born and produced from contact. And... Yeah. I'm sorry, going back when he said, when Buddha said that the uh, teaching is a raft, Right. What, what's the point that he's really making there? Don't be attached to it. Even to the teaching. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so nutriment is anything with Keep listening. 
Uh, let's see, where was I? And, and this contact has what is its source? What is its origin from what is it born and produced? Did you hear that part? It, it's talking about contact right now. Do you hear it? You understand it? It starts at con it starts with craving. Then it goes to feeling. Now we're at contact. Each one of these are separate things. One is a nutriment for the next. Okay? Contact has the sixfold base as its source, the sixfold base as its uh, origin. It is born and produced from the sixfold base. And this sixfold base has what as its source? What as its origin? From what is it born and produced? This sixfold base has mentality, materiality as its source. Mentality, materiality as its origin. It is born and produced from mentality, materiality. And this mentality, materiality has what as its source? What as its origin, from what is it born and produced? Mentality, materiality has consciousness as its source. Consciousness as its origin. It is born and produced from consciousness. And this consciousness has what as its source? What as its origin, from what is it born and produced? Consciousness has, here it says formations, I want to say preparations, as its source. Preparations as its origin, it is born and produced from preparations. And body, speech, and mind. Potential for them to arise. The potential for them to arise. Right. That's why they're preparations. Okay. You mean they're like karmic formations or something like that? Or? Everything is karmic. If you don't have body, speech, and mind, how is how is consciousness going to arise? But but then nama rupa is, comes after. Uh, okay. <laughs> body and and mind comes after. Well, if you just stick with speech. Pardon me. If you just stick with words, if you had no words, what would your consciousness? Okay, so, and what is mentality materiality? What is the origin of mentality materiality? What is the cessation of mentality materiality? What is the way leading to the cessation of mentality materiality? Feeling, perception, formations, contact, and attention, these are called mentality. Now, we talk about this because of the arupa jhanas. Okay. You have a feeling arise and you, you let's say you have a uh, meditation pain arise and you have a pain in your bottom. You, you come and you tell me, I've got a pain in my bottom. No, you don't have a body at this time. 
it is mental pain. See, this is the mental aspect. And that is feeling, perception, formations, preparations, contact, and attention. These are called mentality. All of this is based on our experience in meditation. Of course. <laughs> okay, then... Um, these are mentality. The four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. These are called materiality. So this mentality and this men, uh, materiality are called mentality, materiality. With the arising of consciousness, there is the arising of mentality and materiality. Okay? Okay, still though, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I don't mean to. It's just that because you have formations comes with mentality and materiality, but you already had formations yeah, like before consciousness. Right, so it seems like it's a repetition of what you're saying. If formation arises after consciousness, but then... It can't arise if... Con the consciousness can't arise unless the formations are there, the potential for them to arise. Okay, so is the first formation the potential? Yes, the absolutely. The yes. And consciousness is the potential because you have to have I and form in order for the I consciousness to arise. So both of these are the potential for them arising. Oh, okay. Sorry, but consciousness arises from contact? No. It arises actually from mentality, materiality. When, when there is consciousness, then you're going to recognize mentality, materiality. It, you're not going to be able to unless that happens. But, and that mentality and the materiality, materiality is what? It's the material form. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Then with that, you have the six-fold, six-sense stores. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's it's kind of gross at first, but then it gets more specific. Is that all part of the Contact comes after mentality, materiality. Not, it comes after the six-fold base, excuse me. Okay, so, so is this like consciousness is a... Is it's the potential for, th for things to arise that you will notice. And then when there's contact... Right. They call it Nama Rupa in Pali, and that gets really confusing because Nama means name. Name and form. Name and form. Yes. But it's, it's much easier for me to understand mentality, materiality. That's why I use it. That's the way it's been translated in America, but it's not as accurate as it could be. So, you mean that birth conceptually, this is a cognitive process, is that right? Yeah. I mean, this is concept, concept and form. Is that a way to understand it? 
everything is concept. You, you only think in concept. Right, of course. Feeling precedes concepts. It comes together with perception, which is concept. It comes together with I don't know why this is so difficult for you. <laughs> it's not. Not when you start seeing it for yourself. <laughs> Maybe it's hard to spend a little bit of time unpacking mentality and material. I just did it. <laughs> Didn't you hear what I said? Oh, no, I completely understand. I'm just trying to tell Yeah. <laughs> they operate in everyone does he have a body does he have a mind does he have feeling no And he doesn't have any ignorance, but we're going to get to ignorance too. But that's only for materialists, not actually. Okay, let me get back to this. Okay? Where was mentality and materiality? Uh, and this mentality, materiality, has what as its source? What as its origin? From what is it born and produced? Mentality, materiality, has consciousness as its source. Consciousness as its origin. It is born and produced from consciousness. Now, if you want to get really deep into it, there is a book by Jnanananda on dependent origination. And he goes very, very deeply into consciousness and mentality materiality. So read that. I saw him a couple of times and got into some pretty deep meditation ideas and we talked about dependent origination quite a bit. Okay. And this consciousness has what as its source? What is its origin from what is it born and produced? Consciousness has preparations as its source, preparations as its origin. It is born and produced from preparations. Uh, and these preparations has what as their source, what is their origin, from what are they born and produced. Preparations have ignorance as their source, ignorance as their origin. They are born and produced from ignorance. 
what is ignorance understanding the Four Noble Truths in a very precise and minute way. Every link of dependent origination has the Four Noble Truths in it. <laughs> okay. Now, this is the forward exposition on arising. So, with ignorance as condition, formation. with formations as condition, consciousness. with consciousness as condition, mentality, with mentality, materiality as condition, with the sixfold base as condition, with contact as condition, with feeling as condition, with craving as condition, with clinging as condition, with habitual tendencies as condition. Now, sometimes this is called birth of action. With birth as condition, as sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Now, the reverse order questionnaire on arising. With birth as condition, aging and death comes to be. So it was said, now do aging and death have birth as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With habitual tendencies as condition, birth comes to be. So it was said, now, does birth have habitual tendencies as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With clinging as condition, habitual tendencies come to be. So it was said, now, does habitual tendencies have clinging as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With craving as condition, habitual tendencies come to be. So it was said, now, does clinging have craving as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does craving have feeling as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. So it was said, now, does feeling have contact as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. So it was said, now, does contact have the sixfold base as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Okay. 
with mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. So it was said. Now, does the sixfold base have mentality, materiality as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? <coughs> With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality come to be, so it was said. Now, does mentality, materiality have consciousness as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be, so it was said. Now, does consciousness have formations as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? With ignorance as condition, formations come to be, so it was said. Now, do formations have ignorance as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Good, so you say thus, and I also say thus. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. That is, with ignorance as condition, with formations as condition, with consciousness as condition, with mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. with the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. with contact as condition, feeling comes to be. with feeling as condition, craving comes to be. with craving as condition, comes to be. with clinging as condition. With habitual tendency as condition. Birth comes to be. With birth as condition. Aging, death, sorrow, and ambition, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. The forward exposition on cessation. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of formation. with the cessation of formation comes the cessation of consciousness. with the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of mentality. with the cessation of mentality materiality comes the cessation of sixfold with the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of with the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of <coughs> With the cessation of habitual tendency comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth Aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. The re reverse order questionnaire. With the cessation of birth comes the cessation of aging and death, so it was said. Now, do aging and death cease? with the cessation of birth or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Aging 
With the cessation of habitual tendency comes the cessation of birth, so it was said. Now, does birth cease with the cessation of habitual tendencies or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. So it was said, now do habitual tendencies cease with the cessation of clinging or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. So it was said. Now, does clinging cease with the cessation of craving or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving, so it was said. Now, does craving cease with the cessation of feeling or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling, so it was said. Now, does feeling cease with the cessation of contact or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of contact, so it was said. Now, does contact cease with the cessation of the sixfold base or not? Or how do you take it in this case? <coughs> With the cessation of mentality, materiality comes the cessation of the sixfold base, so it was said. Now, does the sixfold base cease with the cessation of mentality, materiality, or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of mentality, materiality. So it was said, now, does mentality, materiality cease with the cessation of consciousness or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of formation comes the cessation of consciousness, so it was said. Now, does consciousness cease with the cessation of formations or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of formation, so it was said. Now, do formation cease with the cessation of ignorance or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Good, so you say thus and I say thus. When this does not exist, 
that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, with the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of? Formation. With the cessation of formation comes the cessation of? Consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of? With the cessation of mentality, materiality comes the cessation of? The With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of? Contact. With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of? Feeling. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of? Craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of? With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of? With the cessation of habitual tendency comes the cessation of? With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Okay. Now, this is the backbone of the Buddha's teaching. And you don't really hear much about dependent origination from an awful lot of people that are, te quote, teaching Buddhism. And uh, they just kind of ignore it. And they're ignoring the main teaching of the Buddha. Now, one of the things that's real interesting about uh, yeah, okay, uh, ab about this is that because people don't understand craving, they don't recognize it, they don't let it go, they just say craving is desire on a very superficial level. And in dependent origination, there's actually more than one kind of craving. There's the big craving that comes right after feeling, but there's also in each link of dependent origination, there is the Four Noble Truths, and that means that there is some craving in each link. And that's why they arise, because of the craving. Okay? Is the visual tendency like personality? Uh, it's your em emotional the beginning of emotional upsets. Emotional well, yeah, <laughs> it really builds up. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's kind of amazing. I've traveled around the country when I first got back from, from Asia. I, I went around the country three times because I hadn't been in the country for 12 years. I didn't know what America was. I didn't know what people thought. I didn't know what they were into at all. And occasionally I would run across somebody and they would talk about being depressed. So I would explain depression to him according to dependent origination and they understood it. Almost everybody that has depression, they're taking it personally. And they're trying to think this painful feeling away. I went to visit somebody at a holistic or naturopathic college. And that's one of the questions that they ask me about Depression, that seems to be a big thing. But what is depression? If you look at it according to dependent origination, 
there is some contact and feeling arises and it's a painful feeling. And there, then there is, I don't like it. And then there is the story and opinions and ideas and the want to stop taking it personally, but they really caught up with it personally. And then that habitual emotional tendency, the one that they really dislike, they don't recognize it as just thoughts that are trying to control a feeling. So once I started explaining about this feeling arises and it's painful, and what do you do with that? I don't like it. Well, that's the beginning of your suffering. And then right after that, on its heels, you have clinging. Your opinions and ideas about it, which are not really complementary. And then you get into your emotional dissatisfaction with that. So what do you do with that? Well, first thing that I would teach them was that it wasn't theirs personally. It's just a feeling, and it's a painful feeling, so your mind grabs onto it. And then you try to get into your control mode of trying to make that feeling go away, make that feeling be other than what it is. And it doesn't work, and that just makes that feeling and that pain bigger and more intense. So what I said, the, the real way to overcome that problem is to recognize that what you think and ponder on, that's the inclination of your mind. If you think and ponder on a painful feeling and how much you don't like it, that's going to keep coming up over and over again. So you have to learn how to change what you're thinking and pondering on. A feeling is just a feeling. You didn't ask that painful feeling to arise, right? You didn't say, you know, I haven't been depressed for a while. I might as well get depressed now. No, you don't ask those kind of feelings to arise, but it turns into a habitual tendency. And all human beings are pretty close the same. And when we have some painful feeling arise, we think it, we try to think it away. But that only makes it bigger and more intense, right? So that doesn't work. So we have to come up with another way of handling this sort of thing. Guess what I told him to do? Smile. Smile into it. Laugh with it. Let go of your thoughts about it. And then I tell them about six hours. Okay, I can see how that is true for day to day circumstances. But when we get into some of the things that we've been experiencing, like school shootings, how do people smile into that? Well, does it, do you feel better if you worry about it and dislike it and hate it and throw your hatred at it? No, of course it doesn't, but it's so serious if you've experienced it. But what should, what should you do? Does your indulging in the dislike and repeating those thoughts over and over about your dislike, does that make that dislike any easier to it? Okay, so you have to change. What is the definition of compassion? Do you know? 
compassion is seeing another person suffering. Allowing their space to suffer and radiate loving kindness to them. Do you want to change the world around you? You don't do it by getting into your anger and your hatred. You do it by having compassion, not taking it personally. Okay, I'll give you another example of something that I was, I went to a bunch of nurses that were taking care of children that had cancer and they were dying fairly regularly. And they were getting burned out because they became so sad because of this condition. What I told them they had to do was practice their compassion. You can't take my pain away. I can't take your pain away. If I indulge in the pain, I'm just going to make myself sad and I'm going to affect people around me in a negative way. So, what is compassion? It's allowing the space for that sadness to be there, but not taking it personally. And radiating loving kindness into the situation. Okay? You're never helpless, ever, until you start worrying about something or you get so caught up in your dissatisfaction with what's happening right here, right now. Now you are going to feel helpless and you're going to indulge over and over again in depression. You're going to get very depressed because this is happening. Do you know of anybody that really benefits by your depression? Okay. Do you want to give your depression to somebody else because something happened? Are you going to practice your generosity that way? These nurses... I told them they had to allow the space for that pain to be there. You can't take it away. Getting angry at it doesn't work. It just makes you suffer more. What you think and ponder on, that's the inclination of your mind. So what to do? Practice your compassion. Allow that pain to be there. You can't take it away. You can only make yourself suffer. But you can send love and kind thoughts into the situation. You can send loving and kind thoughts to the people that are suffering. And those people that actually have to send love and, love and compassion to the shooter. That's their, they have to do what they have to do. You can only be responsible for yourself. But when you send them loving and kind thoughts, their perspective starts to change. And that's what I taught these nurses. That you can't take their pain away, but you can love them. And you can make them feel happy by playing with them and not feeling sorry because they're so sick. I spent a lot of time in hospitals when I was in Malaysia. Every day somebody would come and they say, please visit my relative or my mom or my dad. They're really, really sick and they're getting close to death. And it was, it amazed me over and over again. I would walk into the room and it was like walking into a morgue for crying out loud. It, everybody was so sad and they were feeling helpless and they couldn't do anything until I taught them that they could. They're being sad about it. They're being angry about it. 
they're being frustrated by it, what you think and ponder on your mind's going to tend towards that if you indulge in that. So you have to learn how to change it. What I'm teaching you right now, loving kindness meditation, it's magical. I had so many people tell me when I walked into the room, it was like fresh air coming into the room. Because I didn't try to take their pain away, I let them have their pain. It's okay for them to have their pain, but I can love them. And as soon as they started feeling that loving kindness, their minds started to get happier. And before too long, they were laughing about things and their pain wasn't as intense. Sometimes the family member, they would walk into the room and they, they would, it would just be immediate sadness. And that made the person that was suffering feel sad. And what good is that? So what do you do? You allow them to have their pain. Sometimes I'd walk in and the pain would be really intense for that person. Well, I can't take it away. I'm not going to get sad and pity that person. But I can allow that space for them to feel that and love them. No conditions. Just start radiating a happy feeling. As my mind became more happy, all of a sudden their mind started to come up to my level. And then I could talk with them. And I would tell them about things like forgiveness and, and clearing away uh, old resentments and things like that with their family members. It was time to clear it out because they were gonna they were gonna die fairly soon. And it's amazing how much after one or two visits to that person in the hospital, I'd walk in the room and they, it was peaceful, it was calm. There was a sense of equanimity and acceptance without fighting with it. So, no, not right now. Uh, you know, when there was the this, this tsunami hit uh, Sri Lanka and uh, some of Thailand, killed a lot of people. And on the internet, oh, everybody was, oh, I feel so bad about that. So many people died and that was really horrible. Well, what good is that? I had, I had one of my friends write to them and say, no, 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 why don't we send them loving kindness instead? And there was an immediate change in the perspective of the people in Sri Lanka and Thailand. Because there was a lot of people that were sending them love and acceptance, not dissatisfaction and dislike. What you think and ponder on. And the more you practice that, the more your mind tends towards doing that. then it becomes much easier. Is it uh, like part of compassion, is it, it, you know, seeing someone's pain, and part of seeing someone's pain is acknowledging it. So I, I agree with your perspective that it's awesome to do the loving kindness. But, I also but you didn't hear what my definition was. Seeing another person in pain, that's acknowledging it and allowing them the space to have their pain. Or do you want to walk in the room and, 
and get real sad and go, oh, you poor dear, I feel so sorry for you. Is that going to help anything? Okay. So there has to be a different kind of perspective that is used. And I, I, I have compassion for them, but I can't take their pain away. It's just an impossibility, but I can make them feel better. And when I get them to laugh, their pain becomes less and less. But it doesn't happen by developing pity. It just doesn't work. When you get deep enough, you'll be able to see the difference. Okay, so keep keep meditating. This is all very much in the realm of feeling, you know. But it, as, as I'm reading this, I don't see um, any support for action. It's like... This you know, is how life works for every human being. This is the process, and it's an impersonal process. If you're alive, I think so. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody that's still around. After a few hundred years, they're not around anymore, so something happened to them. What is the six R's doing? Yes. But that is, that's an answer to this sort of thing, that there is action that can eliminate the craving. What is the six R's? Yeah. Okay. If, if you, at the, at the point of a feeling, whether it's painful, pleasant, or neither painful nor pleasant, if you recognize right then and use the six R's, craving won't arise. If craving won't arise, clinging won't arise. If clinging won't arise, habitual tendency doesn't arise. If habitual tendency doesn't arise, birth of action doesn't arise. If birth doesn't arise, aging and death Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair don't arise. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Monte, is the piece of craving that's in each link, does that have to do anything with I like it, I don't like it, or is it just. Of course it has. A, that's why it's there. Yeah. In any other way. Yeah. That's why you're here, because you had the belief that these things were me, they're mine, they're myself. Even before consciousness, even with... Even before you were born, even before you had another body. That's the reason that this wheel of sansara keeps rolling. Yeah. <laughs> See, we're, we're working with some pretty major stuff here, whether it seems like it or not. You liked something before you were aware. Well, you, you had attachments before you were aware. That's why these things arise. Monday, are you talking about all the uh, links that are occurring in this life rather than some people divide them? I know. You don't, you're not talking about it. 
No. Uh, where am I here? Twelve. Yeah. So, uh, in the forward exposition on cessation, uh, there is a phrase in the beginning, but with the remainder less, less fading away. Right. What does that mean? Letting go of craving. Okay. <clears throat> now, in the Nidana Sutta, Samyutta, there's a section 14 called Ascetics and Brahmins. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to read this to you. Monks as to those ascetics and Brahmins who do not understand these things, first noble truth. The origin of these things. Now it's talking about each one of the links of dependent origination. The cessation of these things and the way leading to the cessation of these things. What are those things that they do not understand? Whose origin they do not understand? Whose cessation they do not understand? and the way leading to whose cessation they do not understand. They do not understand aging and death. Its origin, cessation, and way leading to its cessation. That's first noble truth, right? The origin is aging and death. Uh, excuse me. There is aging and death. That's the first noble truth. One of the things that's happening a lot is foreign monks, they, they have English as their second language. So what they call the first noble truth is everything in life is suffering. And that's not the first noble truth. There is suffering in life you don't have to be a genius to know that. Yeah, it, it is there, but it's not everything is suffering. So they're misleading about the Four Noble Truths, and that causes a lot of confusion. Okay. They do not understand birth. Habitual tendency, clinging, craving, feeling, each one of these has the noble truths in it. Contact, sixth sense door, mentality, materiality, consciousness, formations, their origin, their suffering, and the way leading to their suffering. These are the things they do not understand, whose origin they do not understand whose cessation they do not understand, and the way leading to whose cessation they do not understand. These I do not consider to be ascetics among ascetics or Brahman among Brahman. He's, he's basically saying, I don't consider these people to, that they will get off the wheel of samsara. And these venerable ones do not by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge in this very life enter and dwell in the goal of asceticism or the goal of Brahmanhood. That means you don't experience Nibbana. Okay? Now, but as to those ascetics and Brahmins who understand these things, the origin of these things, the cessation, and way leading to the cessation of these things. What are these things that they understand? So it's what, what we're really talking about is being able to recognize this process because that's what life is. It's a series of little things put together to make up this 
what we call our mind and body. Okay? Dante, sometimes, again, some people have heard say that the second noble truth is craving, that's what most people say, but right. sometimes they say it's ignorance. No. That's not correct. No. That's, that is absolutely yeah, not correct. Well, what is ignorance? Ignorance is not seeing and understanding the Four Noble Truths. But what's the cause of suffering? Craving. The Buddha talks big time about ignorance and craving. These are the two biggies that you have to learn how to let go of. before you'll be able to have that cool experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So getting back to people that have depression. Now sometimes they need to take medicine for it because they really indulge in it, but that's only a temporary. And it gets people, they, they, they get dulled out. They suffer a lot because of this. And they feel like they can't have a regular life. What I am showing them is that when conditions are right, these things arise. And you're getting caught in it and you're taking them personally. So what you have to learn to do is smile and laugh and have fun and help somebody that's worse off than you. And when you do that, you haven't got time for depression. It's the generosity that's really major importance. Help other people to have an uplifted mind. Help them let go of their suffering. Teach them by your example. So, that's why the first part of meditation is generosity. And that's really one of the misunderstood things. Because you only think of generosity, well, there's people that are dying over here, I'm going to give them some money. That's generosity. No, that's not is being with the family and helping them to overcome their suffering. That's generosity. <coughs> One of the problems with the way loving kindness is being taught in this country is it is just a mental idea. May all beings be happy. May they be free from suffering. May, well, may they be free from mental suffering. May they be free from physical <coughs> suffering. May they be happy, well, and peaceful. But there's no feeling in it. It's mental. It's like reciting a mantra. And people do not practice their generosity when they're doing that kind of loving kindness. I know, because I did it for a while. Quite a while until I learn more about what loving kindness actually is. And it's supposed to be a feeling meditation. This is not a mental discipline. This is a feeling discipline. So, I have some people practicing forgiveness. I have some people radiating just loving kindness to their spiritual friends. It's giving to your friend a happy feeling. Now, that, that 
heart math, when they're talking about, well, you radiate loving kindness as a 500 foot radius around you that everybody feels better. That's such a limited way of doing the practice. It is a one-pointed concentration. They are not really benefiting people very much. They, there can be some benefits, but not very much. So when my, my teacher was in, was in California and I was in Thailand, he knew when I was sending him loving kindness because he could feel it. And that was my generosity to him. I was spending a lot of time doing that. And he benefited from it. So the more we can practice for real, and practice our generosity to help other people lessen their suffering. You don't have time to get into your own suffering. You help someone else. You help them to be happy. And guess what? Guess what you get back? You get back that happiness oh, tenfold. It's pretty amazing. And that's what I'm trying to show you with this retreat, is don't think of yourself so much. Be aware of people around you and how they're suffering, and show them how to let go of the suffering. That's how you help. But you got to be the example. You don't show people by saying, well, you got to do this meditation. No. Complete strangers walk up to me and they say, you feel good. What do you do? Well, I teach meditation. Really? What does that mean? Well, I get in a conversation with them. But I certainly don't go out looking for people to try to convert. That's why it only took seven years for people in, in the small town I'm in to really appreciate. And I'm one of the neighbors now. I'm one of the, the gang. And they, they like to stop and talk. It's pretty amazing. Radiate loving kindness to everybody else around you. There was a monk that I met. He, he was Burmese. He didn't speak English, but so I had to go be with a translator whenever I went to see him. He was a truly remarkable person. He memorized the entire Tapitaka. He took a test on it. He got 90% of correct on everything that he did. He was the first one in the country in years to memorize like that. And I went to him and I would talk to him about what was in the sutta and about things that I didn't know or understand. And that was the first time I saw him. And then I spent time at the meditation center and I happened to go up to Mandalay and he was there and dying. I mean, his, he was a skeleton. And I walked into the room and he looked me in the eye and he started radiating loving kindness to me. So I was radiating him back. 
and it was a great visit. And we didn't speak. It was, I was exceptionally happy when I left. So, I found out that the day after I had seen him, he had died. But they said he, he died with smiling. He had, a, he had a happy face. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I helped with that. I don't know. But I know that I certainly enjoyed being around him because he was giving me what I really wanted. And that's to be loved. Everybody wants it. So why not give it to him? People that suffer, why not send them some loving and kind thoughts and compassion? That's what it says to do in the sutta. I'll show you. Okay, the Buddha says, should train thus. Now, this is pretty straightforward. Do this. Our minds will remain unaffected if people say things that we don't like or do things that we don't like. And we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness. Without inner hate, we shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with him, whatever person you're talking to, when you walk away, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. Tell me the Buddha didn't give instructions in meditation. That's pretty plain. Whoever you're talking to, radiate loving kindness to them. It doesn't matter whether they're nasty or not. It doesn't matter if they're angry or not. You radiate loving kindness to them. Their mind settles down fast. And before long, you can start discussing what's really happening with them. But as soon as they walk away, you use them as the reminder to start radiating loving kindness to all beings. Don't just walk around with your head down and thinking this and thinking that and getting caught up in your emotions and your sadnesses and your pains. What good is that? Help other people to be happy. It's pretty simple. So the more you can do that, the more you are an example that other people feel comfortable around. Okay? Now, I kind of like smiling. And I think it's a good idea. The more we practice smiling, the more uplifted our mind becomes. The corners of your mouth. They did a study on the, at the University of Minnesota years ago. When the corners of your mouth go up, so does your mental state. When they go down, so does your mental state. So what to do? <laughs> yeah.
It's your choice what you do. But remember, see, that's the whole thing with mindfulness. Remembering to observe mind. And the more you can remember to have an uplifted mind, what you think and ponder on, that's the inclination of your mind. You spend more time sending loving and kind thoughts, your mind is going to tend towards sending more. That's the way it works. You want to help other people to be happy, overcome their sadness and their anger and their anxiety? You can't talk them out of it because they're just going to fight with you. So you be the example and be happy. And the more you are like that, the more uplifted your mind becomes, the more you help everybody around you in a positive way. You haven't got time to think of your negative stuff. That's one of the reasons why practicing your appreciation. One of the things the Buddha said was that if you truly love yourself, you will never harm another being. So what I did with some folks that they were pretty angry with their parents, the Chinese, the very bossy. So I said, okay, I want you to do this for yourself. I want you to write down five things that you truly like about yourself every day. Can't be the same five every day. Got to think about it. And as soon as you write those things down, you start appreciating yourself for being that way. And when you do that, you start seeing that in other people. And now you're affecting other people in a positive way. It's pretty simple. But we get so caught up in ourselves and I got to do this and I got to do that and I hate this and I hate that. Well, where's your mindfulness? Practice. Practice makes perfect. No, I've, I've spent time in India. I, I've been around people that were truly, truly poor. But did I feel sorry for them? No. I radiate loving kindness to them. You never know what kind of effect you'll get when you do that. It's pretty amazing. Especially young kids. All of a sudden, they're like your kid. They won't let you alone. And that's okay. Be happy. Give your happiness away. Give your appreciation away. See good qualities in other people like you see in yourself and appreciate yourself for being that way. If you want to change the world around you, do it with loving kindness. It's that simple. Okay? Wow, I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> yeah. By any chance, are there any notes or recordings of your discussions with John and Anda? No. She wanted to know if we had any recordings of my discussion with Yonananda. I didn't have any way of doing that. And he was, he was pretty sick. When I met him, he had to take medicine about every hour. And he only had about a quarter of one lung left. He was really sick, and, but he was old too. He was 84, 85 years old, something like that. Yeah? What is Buddhism 
to say about people commit suicide? Because obviously they do have a high rate of suicidal. Uh, they don't go to a good realm when they do that sort of thing. Almost everybody that commits suicide, as they're dying, they wish they wouldn't have done that. And they get, they get reborn in one of the lower realms. Now, I'm trying to teach a lot of people how to never experience the lower realms ever again. When you become a sotapanna, this is part of your giving up an ocean of suffering. You're never going to be reborn less than a human being. And you wouldn't commit suicide, not if you're a, a real sotapanna. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure I understood the difference you were saying between the reincarnation and rebirth. Reincarnation implies a permanent self going from one lifetime to the next. Rebirth is seeing consciousnesses arise and pass away. Very, very quickly. Do you still, it seems like there's still some kind of bundle though that goes from there to well, life? Yeah, that's karmic. Is it the same? No. She went to a heavenly realm. But she found your father. Yeah, she still had attachment to him. She still had craving, she still had memory. The Buddha, as pure as he was, still had some suffering from things that he had done in the past. And he felt guilty for it, and that's one of the reasons that it came back. He was a wrestler, and he was a very strong man, and he would start fighting with people, and he would pick them up, and they were facing the sky, and he would drop them on, their, on his knee and break their back. And in his later life, he had some horrific back pains. Karma is, that is, well, let me give you another, another sutta. Okay, beings are owner of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that is dis that distinguishes being as uh, from being inferior or superior. It's their action. And that's the thing that keeps us tied to the wheel of sansara. Because you've done, you've done a lot of things that aren't so nice. Okay. Now, when you come and you start doing the meditation and you start purifying yourself by lit, practicing the six R's, then you tend to have more and more wholesome things arising for you. And there's great benefit. And you can even know in past lifetimes you might have done really horrific things. In this lifetime, you purify your mind by doing the six R's, you can get off the wheel and you don't have to suffer from past actions anymore.
Okay. The chair of Samarit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.